Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Steve, and I'm an alcoholic, you know, uh, very grateful to be here. I always thank God for God's grace first, foremost, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, sobriety is date 31 double zero, most important date to me in my life, and I'm going to share a little experience, strength, and hope with you guys, and uh, what it was like, what happened, and how it is now. Um, loved alcohol, started at a young, young age, man, it worked, man, and, you know, um, I... I didn't probably know I was an alcoholic until I was probably 16, probably. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but but I, I, I thought I was a real, real good alcoholic because I could drink more than everyone else and I didn't black out and, and um, you know, I didn't get in trouble that much. And, um, you know... I'm the oldest of four siblings, and I um, moved to Hawaii when I was young. Our whole family moved there. I was like five years old, and then 65, and then I turned six, had my sixth birthday on Mala Wharf in Lahaina. And um, back then, it was a little bit different. And um, for me, growing up in Hawaii, I never felt I didn't like it that much when I first moved there, when I was young, because I was a white boy, and um, and they weren't like the most loved people there, for some reason. They they, they used to I used to when I got a little older. I uh, found out about that other stuff that I liked a real lot that that green alcohol that you smoke, and um, and I I really I really liked that stuff a lot, man. Um, and um, so, so, and I, so I started out, you know, that I did probably first, and then around nine or so, I started drinking a little bit. But there was no alcohol at the home. My dad didn't drink, and my mom might have drank a little bit, but I never, you know, it didn't. It, and then I remember I was like. Um, 12, and my dad goes, if any, my, my, my mom and dad got separated when I was in third grade, and um, that's the first time I thought I was going to run away from home when I was like eight, and I was like, man, but I didn't, because there's nowhere to go, you know, and, you know, and um, um, so in high school, man, um, I'd be, like, I would stay with my dad sometimes, and then I would stay with my mom sometimes, you know. I like staying with my mom better because my mom let us drink it, drink at the house, you know, you know, I could smoke my Pacololo too, and, you know, so that went right in, that went right into high school, and um, I never got caught, that was one of the reasons why I think I did it for so long probably, but I thought, you know, in the beginning that rules were made to be broken. As long as you didn't catch me, I could do whatever I wanted to. And, and then I never felt all right in my own skin, but when I drank or I smoked weed, I felt good, and, I, and everything was going to be all right. You know, it just seemed like it. everything was going to be all right. And I, and I ended up getting in trouble finally a little bit. Um, I just was at the wrong place at the wrong time or whatever. And um, somehow I'd always... Um, get out of it, man, somehow. I would always get out of it. And then um, eventually what happened is, is I, I, liked it, I liked it so much I dropped out of high school when I turned 18, man, in my senior year to go, go into the mountains, man, on Molokai. I thought, you know, I'm going to go into the mountains and I'm going to get me, grow me some stuff. And I'd already tried a little bit, but, but um, and, um, I had a lot of friends when I come back with a batch, man. It was, you know, 
you know, until it ran out, and then it would be like, oh, it's time to go back over to the mountains again. And my, my dad, he kind of enabled me a little bit, too, because he, he financed some of my uh, trips, man. He, uh, he, uh, he paid for the helicopter ride. Because I used to get, take a helicopter and get dropped off in the mountains. You know, it was, it was pretty. And the guy that I flew with, man, he, he, that, that guy was um, an ex, like, Vietnam pilot guy. But he liked to fly tourists, but he liked flying growers the most, man. Because he liked taking them into these places, you know, that, and dropping them off. You know, um, you know, um, we fly out of the it, the first time I met him in uh, Kanakakai at the at the um, airport in Molokai, and that was weird because Molokai is real small. So when they saw the helicopter landing on Molokai after at the airport in Molokai, they're like, "What's that guy going behind or whatever?" Because that's what they called the backside of uh, Molokai behind. And um, after that, we'd fly from Oahu straight over to Molokai because we didn't want the locals to see us going behind. And we, the guy I flew with, we'd fly right out of the uh, hangar where the police helicopters flew. But we'd fly real early in the morning, so they weren't even taking their copters out yet. And um, th that was trippy, man. But, um, <laughs> um, so, it, um, so. Anyway, I ended up getting them. Um, my family ended up moving to the States, but I still stayed in Hawaii. And then I came over here in um, um, 83. I came over here, and I was down in Santa Barbara. And um, my sister was going to school at Isla Vista, and I ended up staying over. I came over for vacation, but I ended up staying for, for a um, a couple years, and then I went back to Hawaii in, in 86, and I got in trouble in Hawaii again on Nunner Island a little bit, and um, then I I got in trouble down there, man. I was, I was, what, what happened was, is um, I brought in a car, truck back from, from Arizona, and um, we got, we got pulled over in Hana. We were, we were at Hana, Right before Hana, like on the bridge, slinging weed to the tourists, where well, there was this cop that was going to work at the Hana Police Department that was off duty, and he seen us there. So when we were in Hana, he like came over and got us, and um, wanted to get my friend because I had my friend driving the truck because my license was um, I didn't have a driver's license; it was revoked or whatever. I had an out of state license or something. And um, anyway, he he. Um, he, they ended up arresting my buddy, and then they impounded my truck. And I almost, I almost got my stuff out of there, but they ended up getting the, the one sergeant goes, I go, can I take that backpack out of the truck? And he's all like, yeah, go ahead. And then the rookie goes, like, will you let us search it right now? And I'm like, nope, um, it's not my backpack. It's my girlfriend's. <laughs> so so anyway, anyway, to make a long story short, I was down in Lahaina, about a month later, and I was down underneath the banyan tree with my little Seagram's bag over there with some a couple bags and some hash buds in there sitting next to me. And this cop comes walking over to me, and he goes, are you so-and-so? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And he goes, well, you look just like him, man. <laughs> and, and, and what had happened is that they, they, they'd gotten a grand jury indictment against me because of some stuff that I had in that truck in Hana. And... Um, and and then the cop he's all like, oh, is that your your uh, um, bag over there that that um, Seagram Seven bag? And I'm like, nope, that's not mine. I never seen it before, because <laughs> it, it was a little bit away from me, but it wasn't on me, you know. So then he then he tried to trick me. He goes like, are these your Maui Jim glasses? I had these nice sunglasses in there. Nope, they're not my glasses. <laughs> But anyway, I got out of that, and um, and I was I was um, I had this attorney man, and he's like, oh man, you you got these charges, you better you, you it looks like they're gonna probably try to get you. So anyway, I had to plead guilty to a couple of plea, to a couple of things, and um and um, but my probation officer's like, oh my attorney goes, can you stay out of trouble for five years? And I'm like, wow man, I've been in the cops a couple of times in one year, so I made this geographic went. 
went to North Carolina. My mom, my other brother, were up in North Carolina. I ended up driving from there down to to um, San Diego. We came into El Cajon. We thought we were going to be truck drivers. You we driving the U-Haul from North Carolina? I'm like, when we got down here to California, I'm going, no way, I ain't going to be no truck driver. I don't like that, man. That drive was too long, man. <laughs> And um, so anyway, I ended up I ended up um, getting a job with these these guys doing tree work. I already knew how to climb trees from a little kid in Hawaii climbing coconut trees barefoot with no gear on, just to take coconuts off the tree. And um, so I ended up getting a job with these guys down here, and I was like, I, I was at that point already drinking every every day. And it was that was in um, like '89, so I ended up drinking a long more, t- a lot more time, man. And um, I like whiskey, man. It always starts with alcohol. I love alcohol, but then it takes me to other stuff. So, um, and I knew as an alcoholic, I'm like, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm good at it, drinking. And and I ended and I ended up meeting this. What happened was is um, I was doing some side jobs in Kensington. I was climbing some cocoa palms on the weekend. And I flagged down this car. This gal was in this car, this little ranger. And I said, don't I know you're at my friend's party? And um, next thing you know, I was down there making out with her or whatever. My buddy came back from the dump. He came back from the dump and, and, and um, where'd you meet her? And I'm like, well, you know, because I, I, fl- I was up in the tree when I flagged her down. I came down on a tree and, um, and um, I, I thought I had a good hookup, man. She, I was like, and, uh, and, um. Uh, Oh, yeah. oh, you live over here? And she lived right there in Kensington, but it was her parents' house. And I, I thought it was her house. And um, so, so that, was, that was pretty crazy. But anyway, it, six, six, six months, we were living together a little bit. And um, she had a good job, and I had a job that wasn't that good, but it was a job. And um, she goes, if you want to live with me, we're going to get married. And I'm like, so six months later, went to Las Vegas and got married. And I was married for like 10 years to her, and um, a couple years before I ended up getting here and surrendering, um, I got pulled over for um, running some red lights, man. I mean, yellow lights that turned red, but I, <laughs> but I, I, I ended up hitting this, this cab, and they didn't get me then, and I went home, and they ended up, ended up later, later um, the cops came down, and I'm like, well... I don't know, man. Somebody must have stole my truck because, <laughs> and um, and um, they, they they impounded my truck, and I but they didn't arrest me, and and I called up this, I got this attorney. He goes, "Did you say anything to him?" I'm like, "No, I didn't say nothing to him." He goes, "Oh, good." And and by the way, my truck got stolen two weeks before this happened. Somebody stole it. So what are you trying to say? So the guys came back and said, "Well, I lost my keys at the bar I was at," and um, so they might have stole my truck, but it, but. So he went down there after I got it, um, talked to the detectives, and they go like, well, nobody got hurt real bad, so it's not like a felony hit and run. So we're not going to press charges. And they gave my truck back, and my attorneys are like, you better not say nothing about this. They can bring up the charges within a year. Still was drinking. Drank for another couple more years. And um, so, so that was in, like, 98. So I ended up, I ended up in the in, – uh, the last month of my drinking, I'd, um, it had gotten really bad. I was, like, getting fired from my job and then getting hired back and then getting fired. And then, you know, um, my boss was all like, he, he goes, like, you smell like alcohol. And I'm like, have a breath mint. And my, my first boss has said that. And I go, well, that's some years of accumulation. <laughs> so anyway, it got really, really bad, and I did what everybody else does when they get in real trouble. They called their mom up, man, and um, I'd been home. I was homeless. I was homeless, and my mom came down and she said, "What do you want me to do?" And I said, "I think I need help." And I ended up getting into this recovery home. It was like a, it was a twelve-step role model program, and I wanted to get into it real bad, but there was like a two and a half month waiting list. And I'm like, man, I could be dead in two and a half months. And I don't know, man, this ain't cool. And um, so, so I w- needed to go to 10 days so I could speed up the process. So I went down to 11, 11 Island, and they're like, well, we, you look normal, man. So we don't, we, um, you don't need to go to detox, but you need to go down to St. Vincent's for five days before 
before he will let you in the 10 day. So I went down to Vincent's for five days, you know, that was better than, that was better than being homeless for a second, but it was weird. You know, because there's this guy, the guy in my bunkie was over there. He had two cell phones and he had a pocket full of money in each pocket. And he goes, the dope man. He was like, me and my wife come here every year for four months and we stay at St. Vincent's. And he'd come out there and he'd be slinging his stuff during the day and then go hide out there because the cops wouldn't come and look for him there. And, man, and I'm like, I get out of here, man. And so I did. I, I called up. I called up 1111 Island every day for um the five days, and then they let me into 1111 11 Island for 10 days, and I'm like, oh, man, this is nicer than St. Vincent's. This is better. And um, I had this dog, too, man. I had my dog in the pet motel in La Mesa. Um, man, it was bad. But my wife had ended up taking off with this other guy before I went into St. Vincent's in a 10-day. And, um, but... At that point, I had like three days before I got in. I had three days of being sober before I got into to, um, 10 day. And this, this gal, there was an Amy, and she goes like, you're like a little baby that's three d- days old, man. You can't even save yourself because I was always worried about my wife. So you can't even save yourself. You better save yourself. And I, I took that to heart right then. And she gave me a little bracelet and said, you know, that what would Jesus do? It had the little the letters, you know. And I'm like... And so anyway, I ended up get they, they let me into Pathfinders. After 10 days, I called up. They said, we're not, gonna, we're not sure if we're going to let you in there, but we'll see. And I went down there, and they didn't want to let me in there. But, the, but the, um, the guy that did my intake, he didn't want to let me in there because he thought I was too hopeless. They thought like I was like a wet drunk when I came. They thought I had like wet brain when I came in there. But I didn't, luckily, because there's no cure for that. Once you got that, you ain't coming back. And, um, and, um, but the director goes, we like them hopeless like that. So let him in. And that's a man. They said, welcome home. And I was like crying, like a little crybaby, man, that somebody would welcome me home, man. Nobody welcomed me home for a long time at, at that time, you know. And, and I, I think that's when I, I, I'd already probably surrendered because when I, before I got into, um, St. Vincent's and my mom came down there. I, 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 I prayed to God and said, God, help me. I don't know what to do. And then I ended up down there. And um, AA was like was like boot camp. I mean, uh, Pathfinders was like boot camp to AA. So, and I stayed there nine months to the day. It's it, it six months. I, I was like, I had, I had done one, two, and three, but I didn't want to do an inventory. And I had about six months in my... My wife had gotten into Rachel's, and she ended up drinking on the anniversary of her father's death, man. And that weekend, man, I had, I had my fourth step done and did a fifth step with my sponsor. I felt like I'd relapsed, and I and I was already in a recovery home. And um, so it, it had it, it took for her to go out and drink for me to be get busy. And so I always say, well, it took me six months and uh, one day to do a fourth step with a fifth, you know, without drinking a fifth. And, you know, a fourth step is only as good as if it's followed immediately by a fifth. And I always say, you know, the, the, the steps, if you are doing a step a month, man, you're in trouble. If you, if you really want to be here um, and you're a real alcoholic and you haven't taken the steps, time is not on your side. You know what that means? Is it's urgent. It's urgent for you to get busy. Um, for me, the reason I take the steps is because I like the results I get from them and I wanted to give something back. And I wanted to be more than a member that just didn't want to have a drink. I wanted to be a member that could carry a message and not a mess and bring able to help other people too. To me, that the most important thing is, is that when I, when I um, trust God and clean house and help other people, not just alcoholics, but regular people too, that it, it's like taking out an insurance policy against my slip, man. It's in that, to me, it's like putting something into the spiritual bank for my Heavenly Father. And I like praying a lot, and I like going to meetings a, a lot too, like um, every day. I only go to meetings on the days I drank, but I like to go to meetings every day. And I, I like, I like I, my favorite is doing two meetings a day. But sometimes I'll do three or four, 
but I've done more than I've, the most I've done is like six in a day. But 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 I like doing two a day. That's my favorite. And um, and I've done it for a long time. Um, meeting makers make it to me. To me, meetings are like links in a line, a lifeline, or a chain. And the closer they are together, the stronger the the chain is. And there's no weak spots in it. So there's less chance of drinking and having a slip between meetings if you go to a lot of meetings. Plus, um, I like getting presents. So when I stay in the so when I stay in the present, which is right now, I'm getting a present all the time. And if I ain't drinking, that's a double present, and that's even better. And, and that and that includes left-handed cigarettes, man. You can't, you can't. You, a lot of people think a lot of people think sobriety is just not drinking alcohol. Well, to me, that's bullshit. If you're doing other stuff, it's the same thing as drinking, man. You just switched. Switched to something else, you know, and so, so, and with my luck, you know, since since I like to do other stuff too, if I was like drink smoking a joint, I'd be smoking crack at the end of the day with that stuff, probably, you know, and um, so I got to remember that. Uh, for 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 me, for me, for me, my first my first year in sobriety, my first year on the eve of celebrating a year, I got pulled over by the cops. Uh, crossing a double yellow line, turning from Fairmont onto University, going going uh, um, west, and they pulled me over because I passed it. But it was a green light, but they didn't like it because I crossed over the double lines before where the turn part goes. And they pulled me over. And they go, "We know you're on something. We're getting our DUI experts and all this crap. We got somebody, you know, because of my priors. They're like, we got somebody. I go, hey, check this out, man. I don't." I'm going to be celebrating a year tomorrow. They didn't. They didn't care. They didn't want to hear about that. They go, "We're not saying you've been drinking, but you did something." You know. So you know they and 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 that and that time they imp- impounded my vehicle because I'd been in trouble before. But but I was sober that time, and I'm like, "That's just bull." You know. And um, I was down there in jail, and they didn't take my boots away. And I'd never ever been to jail sober or clean ever in my life. Every time I'd ever went to jail was because I was under the under the influence of something. And um, that was weird too, man. I was like, I was all pissed. I'm like, I'll show them. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to go get a bottle of whiskey and an eight ball. I'll show them. And, and luckily I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But what happened was is they took the piss for the alcohol and then they, no, they took the blood for the alcohol and the piss for the drugs. And the and the um, blood came back with no alcohol in it, but the piss came back showing that there was drugs in there. And they, it took like nine days for them to test it, and they're testing in Riverside. And then I had a and, and I didn't have enough money to have a regular attorney, so I had a dump truck driver, a public pretender. And, and he's like, "We'll drop one of your priors if 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 you plead guilty." I go, "No, take it to a jury trial." And then the, and then they go later. I went and seen him. And he's all like. And I'd gotten a book on a drug testing and all this stuff, and I go, I want to see a chain of custody on the on the on the piss. And they're like, What do you think this is an OJ trial? And I go, to me, to, to, to me it is, man. I'm the one on trial, you know. And you know, you know, you know. but he wouldn't. They wouldn't show me a chain of custody, and you know, you know. so that was that was like that was weird too. But anyway, anyway, so so it was messy. It was messy with my with my uh, serenity a real lot, uh, because because they were saying I was dirty in, when I was clean, and I'm like, no way, man. Even my sponsor thought I was like, I was lying, and, and, and uh, I ended up firing him and getting another sponsor. But, but, uh, the crazy thing about it is, is that. When I was doing the right thing, I was talking to God, and, and, and I go, God, if you want me to go do the time, I'll go do the time, but I'm not going to say I'm dirty when I'm clean. You know, I've done that my whole life. So if I don't stand for something, I'll fall for anything. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I said, take it to the jury another, the next time. And two weeks before I had to go for the, to court, the, the public pretender calls me up and he goes, like, add me to your pre- Christmas card list. Because we talked to the DA and they're dismissing the charges. 
And um, that was the best Christmas present I could have got right then. Man. I was like, all right. I was like stoked. Man. And, and um, yeah, I was. I was really stoked. And, um, and so that was, to, to me, I'm just sharing that for anybody here. If you're doing the right thing, man, you need to, you need to be, tell the truth and not lie about whatever you're doing just because you're afraid, you know, you know, and, and the th- you were among the greatest liars, cheats, and thieves in the world to begin with, first of all. Alcoholics, man, they don't get here because they're like nice guys and they, they're doing a good job and they're, they're, they're nice and kind and loving to other people. And We get here because we're selfish pigs. There's never enough for us. We were more, 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 me, me, me. If you don't got enough, you got to go. And if, that, and if we're not rid of that selfishness, it'll kill us. You know, we have to be. And that's one of our, that's why we have certain codes and stuff in the book it talks about. And the thing about the book that's so cool is that if you know the book and you're armed with the book, you can secure another person that needs help in recovery. You can. And then you can tell if somebody's lying or not. Because the book doesn't lie. The book doesn't lie. That's why that book's real, real important to know. Um. I like it when somebody, I, I'll smash them too, man. If they start talking, they, they, they know the book and they're talking stuff that ain't true, I'll call them on it right in a meeting, man. I'll bust their balls, man. I don't care. Man. <laughs> show, me, show me where it says that in the book. And, 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 um, because I don't like it when somebody's like talking that they know when they're not talking the truth. I just don't. And sometimes I need to keep my mouth shut, but I don't usually. And, 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 the, and, the, and the problem is, is that I can't take it back once I say it. Words are very powerful, man. You need to pick your words, too, when you say them. And a lot of times I'll say it, and then I hope oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know, because I've gotten my tro- myself in trouble a long time in my life by saying stuff that wasn't kind and nice and loving and true. And sometimes it's true, but it might not be kind, but it might be necessary, you know. Um, Anyway, so my second year, I got pulled over by the sheriffs, and um, they, no, it was the highway patrol the second year, right, right around my birthday, and it was a fix-it team, because my seatbelt wasn't on, and um, I had, actually, I had two, two fix-it tickets that year. The other one was I, was, I had my pickup truck with a bunch of palm trees hanging out of the back of it from a date palm, and it was covering up my license plate and the brake lights, and um, a highway patrol pulled me over for that, too, and he's like, is this your business or you're working for somebody else I go no it's my business you know because I I just had a little business but my truck was all a little f-150 or whatever King Kev and I'm go I, he goes well I'm going to give you a fix-it ticket and it was a commercial highway patrol which I was super lucky that it wasn't that it was my business not somebody else's because he would have really slammed me probably he goes I'm going to give you a fix-it ticket on those so as soon as you get it dumped show him show a cop that your lights work and you can see the license plate and he'll sign it off. So I got both those fix-it tickets taken care of for like 10 bucks each. Went down to the highway patrol place. Third year, the sheriffs pulled me over. I was looking for a job and I was looking at the Thomas guys before we had the smartphones, <coughs> right like that. We have them now. And, um, and um, the, the sheriffs just wanted to see who I was right in Spring Valley too, man. They're like, okay, come over here, man. We're going to put you in handcuffs for, for your protection. I'm like, I'm like, gosh, so you can beat me up better, huh? No, but, been, been mobbed by cops before, too, in Hawaii one time, but um, that was a different, a different time. So, but anyway, anyway, um, my sixth year, I was sober six years. I ended up, I ended up um, going to school to get my contractor's license because I'd been a certified tree worker since '93. And, and that's like right under an arborist. And I had to get like continued CEUs, but I didn't have a contractor's license and I was contracting tree work, doing them for over the amount that you're supposed to do them for. Because they don't like it to, to you to do it for over over 500 unless you got a license or they can bust you. And they got the contractor police, man. They set up stings. I didn't get caught, but I almost did a couple of times. I, and I'm like, something ain't right here, man. They got too many contractors coming over here to look at this job. And it wasn't just tree work, other kind of stuff. I'm like, they're trying to get anybody that doesn't have their license right. So I'm out of here. See ya. So, but anyway, I ended up getting my contractor's license. I ended up buying a house in Lemon Grove. Had the house, had the house till, um, 
2012 when I lost it because of because I was trying to get a loan modifications and and um, they they said they're going to give it to me but they auctioned it off from underneath me and um, that was kind of a bummer at that time but I got through that um, and um, the point is that anything that can happen to you in life sober can happen to you drunk too or sober and and um, anything that you can, can happen to you while you're sober, you can get through it without drinking because somebody else has gone through that. And they've gone through that, and we're here to help each other too. That's the crazy thing because nobody knows us like we know us. Nobody does, and you can't buy that kind of therapy. And and for me, it was super hard because I thought since I was such a good alcoholic, when I before I got here, man, I used to have whiskey in my coffee on the way to work. To go climb trees, man. And, and I wasn't supposed to, man. Every day. For like 10 years straight. Easy, man. For sure. And I was driving big trucks. And sometimes we'd stop at the liquor store. I knew where every liquor store was like a like an AA meeting now. Like a, you know. And, and, and I was, we'd stop at them on the way to jobs and stuff like that. It was crazy, man. I thought that alcohol was like fire water or liquid courage. But, but in, in AA and in recovery... It takes more courage not to drink and stay here. And, and, and if you have a sobriety date, which, which I know what mine is, and I have one, and you protect it and you cherish it and you make it a present so you can have a present every day, you, you got it made. All the, all the rest of that stuff is just like icing on the cake. Sometimes, and I still prefer another person's pain over my own, I do. I do. If I'm paying attention and somebody's also sharing what they're going through, and I'd rather somebody come in here and whine than go out and drink wine. You know, I'd rather somebody come in here and whine because this is where we, we, we let people do that, come around here and say that. But we prefer them to, to talk about the solution. But if you're hurting, I'd rather you come in here and share about it. Because how is somebody going to help you if you don't tell on it? What's bothering you? Why, what's going on? And sometimes all it takes is for you to go up to somebody and say, hey, how are you doing today? Are you all right? Because you don't look all right. And they might lie to you, but it might be just enough to, to, to shake them out of it. And um, that's why it's so important to have a home group. And a home group is a meeting that you go to all the time. And, and, and if you don't go there all the time, you know, you might think it's your home group, but it's really a home group is a meeting you go to all the time. You're not going to... You're not going to miss it unless you're out of town or sick or something like that. Or you got to be working or you got a job you got to start early in the morning or something. You're not going to miss it. And the reason why is because if you don't show up, people will call you, man, and see how you're doing. What's up? Are you all right? That's important. Um, know where your next meeting is going to be. That's a good thing to know, too, man. Where your next meeting is going to be. I know where my next meeting is going to be. It's going to be tomorrow morning, man. Easy does it, riders, man. I'm down at 7 o'clock. Then I'm going to go from there to Pathfinders at 9 o'clock men's meeting. You know, I know where I'm going tomorrow. And, um, and if I'm a good boy today, man, and I don't drink be- between now and tomorrow, I'll be sober tomorrow. Um, but I'm not so sure I'm not going to drink again. I never say that. You know, I'm never going to drink again. But if I stay in God's will, I won't ever drink again because God's will for me is to never drink again. But I don't stay in God's will all the time. I sometimes take my will back, man. I like it sometimes. I like to get in enough pain. And then I'll go, okay, God, I'll give it to you now. I'll turn it back over to you, man. This is gonna, this could hurt, but, but I'm getting better about being in God's will or praying to God before I get in trouble. So when, I get, when the trouble comes, it's not as much trouble. It's easier to handle. And, it's, and there's less chance of me getting in trouble or in danger or getting hurt. When, it's when I have to do something real dangerous if I pray to God before, it'll make me so I'm going to be more careful and not getting hurt. And, and you know, that's hard to do sometimes because you want to do something so fast that you want to because you want to get it done faster. Because if you get it done faster, you make more money usually when you're like contracting out a job because you're not going to have as many hours in there. You know, and I, I, I subcom, subcontract out to another tree company sometimes, and um, they like they don't like it when I get done at lunchtime. They don't, because they're paying me by the day. And um, another thing is, is that on my contractor's license, on my card, it says, it says, 
um, 8-31-06. So six years after I got sober, on the same date of my sobriety date, is my contractor's license. So, and I, you know, I got that license still. It's my own license, in my name, you know, not somebody else's name. You know, the good thing about being a contractor is, if you're a contractor, a legal one, they can't bust you for doing illegal contracting jobs. But the, <laughs> but the, the, the other thing is, is they can't fire you. You can't get fired. Like when I go and I subcontract with these other guys, they gave me keys to all their trucks, man, and I'm not even one of their employees. That's trippy, you know, the keys to the kingdom. So you know how people go like, oh, you can have the keys to the kingdom? You can have that in AA. And the other thing is, and I'll close with this, is that for us, man, in recovery and being here, you can live in heaven without going to heaven dying. You don't get to do that anywhere else, man. Who, how many people can say that they're, oh, I, I'm, I'm living in heaven right now. I am. I am living in heaven right now, and I'm alive. And, 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 I, and I love living, too. And that's a, the that's a thing about, you know, for me, life is precious. You never know, because it could be a blink like that. You never know what can happen. But if you live your life right and well, when you go home to sleep tonight, you're going to be able to sleep all right. You're not going to be worried about somebody coming after you, hunting you down. You know how many, how, I used to have to stay up all night before because I was afraid somebody's going to come and get me or do something, man. And I wanted to be ready for them, you know. Now I don't even worry about that shit. Man. I don't. But, but thank, thank you guys all for, for having me down here tonight. And I hope you guys got something out of it. And I love you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.